Uh, we got a lot of stuff to go through. I'm Scott Benson, Manager of Resource and Transmission Planning. I've been working on this IRP all the way through. Real quick, before we do the safety briefing, we're going to risk our lives by doing this before we do the safety briefing. Raise your hand if you've been at four IRP meetings. Okay, how about at least three? It doesn't count if you used to be an LES employee. All right. Okay, so really good. How about if you just been to one before today? All right, I knew I saw a lot of the same faces. Thank you very much. Public participation is a big part of this. That brings us to tonight where we go through, we kind of unveil the whole plan, we get your feedback. Real quick, safety briefing. Anybody needs an AED or fire extinguisher? They're right back there in the back. Okay, uh, real quick show of hands for everybody who knows first aid and CPR. Certified, okay, very good. I need a volunteer to call 911 in case we have a problem. Shelly's got her hand up, she's had it up for minutes. Okay, very good, I know you know the address, thank you. And I don't think we're gonna have any problems with weather, but if we do, we're gonna take shelter right outside here in the bathrooms, okay? Uh, follow LES staff, they'll take you right there. Okay, integrated resource plan. We've been going through this for the entire year, all right? The shading there, that shows you everything we've done. We've gone through a bunch of consultant studies, a bunch of different meetings, a bunch of different workshops, all leading up to tonight when we run the full analysis and we go through those results and what those results have led us to as far as an action plan. Here's what we're gonna go through. Usually I told the board this, usually I don't do agendas, but I'm doing one tonight so you know what's coming. All right, we're gonna go through a little bit of the modeling structure, just so you get a feel for what we put together because you gotta understand that to understand the results. If you've been to some of the meetings, you've seen a little bit of this before. We're gonna talk about the results in terms of the resource screening because we have a ton of resources. We gotta kind of filter that down a little bit. Then we go through the results of what we call the base case analysis. That's kind of the first step. And then we tweak a whole bunch of little things and see what it does to results. Those are the sensitivities, okay? I'm gonna tell you right now, cause I'm an honest guy, that is by far and away the boring part of the presentation, all right? If you can make it through that, you're good. The next step is where we get into the exciting stuff. And that's, we take those results and we say, what have they taught us? And what does that mean we're gonna do on two fronts? One is a preliminary plan, a plan as of today, for achieving LES's decarbonization goal, net zero CO2 emissions from our generation portfolio by 2040. And then the big one is based off the results and that decarbonization plan, what's the action plan for the next five years out of the IRP? For those of you who don't know, we do an IRP every five years. So you do a five year action plan so that by the time that's done, we start over with a new IRP. Okay, so a little bit on the methodology. We run a software package called the GIS developed by EPRI way back in the 80s. Hold on, I gotta move over because apparently I'm not on the, how far can I go? Amber, how far can I go? Okay, you're, see you're learning stuff on the fly, just like me. If I go that way, anybody point me out, all right? Okay, so we use Aegeus put out by EPRI in the 1980s. It's used by a bunch of different companies, probably the biggest one uh, up there being MISO, Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. They're the same thing as the Southwest Power Pool. They just sit to the east of this. Like if you go across the river in Iowa, they're near MISO. They've put a lot of money into a GS and improving it. And we've benefited from a lot of that stuff. What a GS does is it does what's called dynamic programming. So it looks at all the different resources you've given it. And it looks at every possible combination to come up with the optimal plan. Optimal means it's going to be the lowest cost on a net present value basis considering construction costs of all your new resources and what it costs you to operate, maintain basically all the ownership. And it does all of this by making sure you don't sacrifice on reliability. This is how our model starts. Two systems. System A is LES. System B, the Southwest Power Pool, the electricity market we participate in. The first thing we do is we load LES's latest load forecast and all of our existing resources into the LES side. We've got to build out the LES side of the model. We do the same thing for the SPP side of the model, but there we use their latest models, 2021, what they call integrated transmission planning model. All their data, all their assumptions, that's what we load in to represent all their resources, all their load projections. For new resource options, we leverage a big document put out every year by the US uh, EIA. So Energy Information Administration, 
they do a great job of doing a bunch of assumptions for what it costs to own and operate all these different resources. And it's important to use that one book because it's a common set of assumptions. They're all apples to apples. You can read an article about one resource. You can read an article about another resource. What you don't know is did they use comparable assumptions? The EIA tries to use the same underlying assumptions for all the resources. Why do we need those new resources? Because we're going to look at retirement. OK, what we're going to do in the model is anytime we have a coal resource that runs at less than a 20 percent capacity factor, we're going to retire. it. Now, for those of you who don't know, capacity factor is just a way to say of a resource's total capability. How often did it do that across the year? If you have a resource that runs at its full output the entire year, every hour of the year, that's 100 percent capacity factor. OK, if it runs at its full output for half the year, that'd be 50 percent capacity factor. If it runs at half output for all year, 50 percent capacity factor. Just a simple way to say how much did that run? All right. Coal resources aren't built to sit there and come on real quick and then go back off. Too many staff, too much time. So anytime one of them runs below a 20 percent capacity factor for five straight years, we tell the model retire that. All right. Doesn't mean in the real world they necessarily have to retire. But what you're saying is market forces are telling me that resource probably not economically viable, so we're going to remove it. All of our fuel costs come from, again, the US EIA. They do long term projections. So what are we talking about there? Oil, coal and nuclear, but not natural gas. Natural gas is one of the most volatile fuel sources that we've seen. Everybody can attest to that in the last year or so, right? So what we do when we run this is we vary natural gas from $1 per MMBTU to $10 per MMBTU in $1 increments. I will tell you, if you go back in recent history, that has spanned from about $2 per MMBTU up to just under nine. So it's a pretty good range. That's to give us a feel for low natural gas prices like we saw the last couple of years, higher natural gas prices like we're seeing now, because we know over the future they're gonna bounce around. That's what they've always done. We also vary a regulated value on CO2 emissions. So what do I mean by that? When I say a regulated value, it means it applies to not just LES's resources, everybody in SPP. That ranges from $0 per ton to $90 per ton in $10 increments. You put all that together, that 10 by 10, and what you see there is you get a 100 square grid. Every time we run a case, what we really mean is we're running 100 different scenarios, looking at all those combinations of natural gas and CO2 prices, right? That's going to be important because you're going to see that grid all night long. So here's what we do with the methodology. A GS is going to go through and it's going to come up for each of those 100 squares with the lowest cost optimal plan, and that's accounting for purchases from the SPP market and sales to the SPP market. And we're going to do this study over a 20 year period, 2022 to 2041. So every year of 20 years for every one of those 100 cases, we're going to say, what is our best resource plan? Now, we also put a 30 year extension period on the end of that to make sure that the resources we build in the first 20 years, we capture all those financing costs because a lot of them are going to last a long time. So you're paying that debt off for over 30 years. So that gets factored in as well. And I told you it has to do this reliably. So there are two metrics. Number one, the main one, the Southwest Power Pool has a rule that every member, including LES, if you have load, you have to bring enough accredited generation to the market to meet your peak load, plus an extra 12% reserve margin. The theory is everybody's got an extra 12% when units are out of service, got problems, we should still have enough. But that's accredited generation. Accredited generation means the amount you can count on at the time of your peak. If you have a natural gas, coal resource, nuclear resource, for the most part, Whatever that's built to, it's called its nameplate rating. That's usually what you get to be accredited rating. You have to test it, you have to prove it, but that's what you get. If you have non-dispatchable resources like wind, solar, or limited duration storage like resources like battery storage, you don't get a count 100%. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's the big key. You got to have enough accredited generation to meet your peak low plus 12%. And then one more, it's a little more in the weeds, it's called loss of load probability, and some people call it loss of load expectation. What you do is you do a big statistical analysis and you say, you know what, if we look at this over a number of years, how many hours does our load exceed our available generation, accounting for different outages and all those things? So the Southwest Power Pool, they have no requirements for that. 
what they do is they run studies saying, you know what, we're not going to shed load more than one day in 10 years. Now, honestly, they plan on never shedding load in the real world. But in a planning model, they say we want to make sure that we have enough generation to cover our load no more than one day in aggregate over 10 years. And that's how they set things like the 12% reserve margin. What SPP tells us is as long as you meet the 12% reserve margin, you don't have to worry about anything else. When we run our model, we say we want to make sure our units are reliable. So what we do is we say, you know what? We want to make sure we don't shed load more than two days in a 10 year period. All right, we just double SPP's litmus test to make sure that we're doing our part for reliability. Both those cases are in there. If you don't meet those cases, doesn't matter what your cost is, you don't apply. That's how we're going to run all the models, okay? When I talked about the SPP resource mix, this is what's in there. The first three sets of years, 2023, 2031, uh, 2026 is in the middle there, I guess. That comes from SPP's model. That's their latest shot of what they think is going to be out there. 2041, what we had to do is take their 10-year model and extrapolate it out using all the same assumptions. The red line up there, that's their peak load. So if you haven't seen this chart before, you're looking at that right now going, why in 2041 does SPP have twice as much generation as they need to meet their peak load? That's because what I'm showing you here is the nameplate generation, what you built. If you build 100 megawatts of wind, there's 100 megawatts in that column. But what we just talked about, you have to have enough accredited generation, the generation you can count on at the time of your peak to make sure you can serve it. That's why they've got so much extra. And that gets us into what credit they give for non-dispatchable generation, wind, solar, battery storage. We had a whole workshop. Raise your hand if you were at the ELCC workshop, which was just last month, okay? Quite a few people. This is a really hairy topic. We had a whole workshop. We spent well over an hour going through it. Uh, real quick though, so you understand it, what you've got up there, the purple is battery storage, the yellow is solar, and the blue is wind. I'm gonna pick out solar and explain this to you real quick. So if you look at solar, starts off at 72 percent and by 2041 it's down to 57 percent okay what this is trying to tell you is how much is that going to help service in our most prolific hours of need when the load is the highest right and the example i tell folks all the time with solar because these numbers typically go down the more you bring in of a certain type of resource the lower you get account and the great example is california how many people have heard about solar in California? Anything about solar in California? When the first solar went in the state of California, the very first project, it was the greatest thing ever because their peak load was late in the afternoon, early evening, the sun was up, you're getting sun, like, hey, we can't have too much of this. But now they have so much of it that their peak load doesn't happen when the sun's up anymore. It happens in the early evening, right when the sun goes down, all the solar kicks out and boom, their load pops up and now they have to serve it with something else, right? If you were the first person to put solar in California, it was worth a lot. If you go to the state of California and say, hey, good news, I'm gonna build solar. They're gonna say, well, thanks, but it's not gonna help that much because your solar is gonna generate the same time as what? Everybody else's solar we already have. That's why the number tends to go down over time. You get less juice for the squeeze. Look at the bottom here, that's the blue lines. Look at wind. Wind, the main line goes up. I just told you it always goes down and that one goes up, right? It goes up to from 19% to 28%. So why is that? Well, when we had this much solar at SPP, we had the same problem as California. The solar pushes the new peak load you got to serve into the nighttime hours, which is bad for solar. That's why the solar line goes down. But you know who it's good for? Wind, because generally in the summer, when you hit your peak loads, the wind blows more at night than it did in the peak of the afternoon. And so even though the solar goes down, it moves the peak into a part that's more symmetrical with wind, that goes up a little bit, all right? So these do kind of help each other. Now look at solar again. There's three yellow lines up there, right? The first one's what they call tier one. Now with tier one, they say, you know what? That can be any solar resource you have as long as you have firm transmission. And firm transmission means you go to the Southwest Power Pool, you say, I have a load over here, I have a generator over here. I would like you to confirm that I have transmission service all the time between those two. And the Southwest Power Pool says, sure, we'll do that for anybody, but we're gonna run an engineering study and tell you how many dollars it's gonna take to upgrade the transmission system to support that. And then you have to pay it. LAS has firm transmission for all of our resources. 
And then they say, okay, so you can have firm transmission, but there's a limit. So in tier one, we're only going to let you count 20% of your average peak load over the last three years. That's all you can have in solar. If it's wind, we'll let you have 35%. That's in tier one. Tier two is all the wind and all the solar you have with firm transmission. That's above that limit. And then tier three is everything you put in that you don't worry about transmission. You say, I just want to build it. All right, I'll take my luck of whether it gets there or not. Look at the solar lines. Tier one solar in 2041, 57%. You build 100 megawatts, you get to take credit for 57 towards meeting your peak load plus 12%. Where are tier two and tier three? Like way down there around and close to 12% maybe and the other ones about five. Big difference. Okay, so think about that. You're spending the same amount of money to build a solar resource. If it's tier one, you get to count 57 megawatts. If it's tier two, maybe you get to count 12. If it's tier three, you get to count maybe about five. It's a big deal when you look at those numbers. You don't have to understand all the engineering behind it. That's what the workshop was for. You just got to understand that there's those tiers out there. All right. LES's limits uh, for 2041, they're up there. Out in 2041, based on our low projections, we're going to be limited to 292 megawatts of wind in tier one. 167 megawatts of wind of solar in tier one. There is currently no limit for battery storage, but SPP is working on that right now. I will guarantee you anything within a year or so, there's going to be a tier one limit for storage. We just don't know where it is. We modeled that there isn't one because today there isn't one. Today, LES is one of the few members of SPP that's over the tier one limit on wind. We're one of the few people that has to spill into tier two. Most people aren't at that level. So you do all that, we look at our load forecast, we look at what we're going to get account for these non-dispatchable resources, and this is what we call our load and capability. The orange columns, that is all the accredited generation that we have in each year. The gray line, that's our peak load plus the 12%. Remember I told you our study is going to run from 2022 to 2041. If you look at that, is there any time where the orange column is below the gray line? No. So if we have all our resources in stock, we would never have to add anything. But what's the one thing we said we we're going to model in the beginning? Coal retirements, right? So when those coal retirements happen, we're going to take generators out of that stack. And what the software is going to do is decide what is the best way to build a portfolio to put things back and make sure we have enough to meet that gray line. Does that all make sense? Done. What it looks like in, are you saying in the 2017 IRP, like the last one we did? Yeah. So that chart back in 2017 looked very similar. Uh, with one exception, back in 2017, we were sitting on a decision whether to continue a contract for our existing hydro allocation from the Western Area Power Administration. Uh, in 2017, we were evaluating that contract, even though it came up in 2020, we had decided to sign it in 2017 or not. And so we took it out. And when we took that out, we were actually deficient, I think somewhere in the mid 2020s. But with it in there, it looks similar to that. Yeah, give or take. They were probably a little higher because our generation's about the same and our load would have been a little bit lower. I don't think we've actually decreased. If you look at, if you normalize for weather and everything, I think we're showing a little bit of low growth. What's the drop in 41? What's the drop in 41? So LES has wind contracts, our three largest wind contracts. One expires in 2036. There's a little drop if you pay attention, and two of them expire in 2041. That's what drives those, okay? Now, does that mean they couldn't be extended? No, you can negotiate extension, but if you just read the contract, they're supposed to go away, so that's what we model in here. You guys still got a question, Ken? Uh, I know you can't answer this right now, but everything now I keep wondering, what's the new Biden effect going to be on all this stuff? So, Ken, you're 100% right. I can't answer that right now. But I'm going to answer that in about 42 minutes and 38 seconds. Okay? Yeah. All right. It's coming. It's coming. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about the EIA has all these resources, tons of resources. We love that they do this. They do a great job. But since our model does dynamic programming, tries every combination of every resource, we can't handle all of them. It just takes too much. So we got to filter it down. So we're going to walk through real quick, take five minutes to make sure everybody understands. Because, and why do we do this? Because most times we do IRP meetings, I've come to find out everybody walks in the room with a favorite resource. And they don't like it when I don't use their favorite resource. So I got to explain to you how we get rid of these, okay? So there's the list. That's everything we looked at. That's everything that's in the EIA book. The references are all in the IRP report. You go look at that, you can look up all this stuff and it's gory beautifulness. So the first thing we did, we said, okay, we've got a decarbonization goal, net zero CO2 by 2040 from our generation portfolio. So anything that's not optimal carbon capture and sequestration that is a base load or an intermediate load resource, something that's gonna run a lot, we're gonna get rid of that. And what's optimal? Optimal today, what they're saying is the best you could build is 90% carbon capture and sequestration. That means 10% of the CO2 still goes out in the atmosphere, the other 90 gets captured, gets stored somewhere, all right? So we're gonna get rid of regular coal, we're going to get rid of coal with only 30% efficient carbon capture and sequestration, and we're going to get rid of regular natural gas combined cycle. Real quick, combined cycle means you take a natural gas simple cycle unit, just a regular turbine. Usually you take fuel in, make electricity, heat goes out the exhaust stack. With a combined cycle, you take that heat that would have went out the exhaust stack, you capture it, you use it to make steam, which makes even more electricity. So for the same amount of fuel, you got more oomph out, all right? There are two combined cycles in the state of Nebraska. One of them's right here in LES's service territory, our Terry Money Generating Station. So we take those off, all right? Next step, oh, I clicked too far. We're gonna remove any resource that is not practical in the SPP region, all right? Now this is important because these are usually the ones that people love and they take me to task for taking them out. First one, geothermal, all right? You can't practically build today geothermal in the Southwest Power Pool region. You'll read articles that say if you go deep enough, we can power all kinds of stuff off geothermal. And that's true. But where we live, you have to go so deep towards the Earth's core that the metallurgy won't stand up. You can't make use of it. All right. You can't drill down that far and then bring it up to where you can make use. So for today, no geothermal. Hydropower, that's not really a Southwest Power Pool thing, that's kind of an everywhere thing. There just aren't any good places left to put in hydro facilities because they put them all in. That's a good thing because they're out there, but it's not like you can just decide to go build a new one. People talk about you could build little ones on streams, you could do that, but they don't make much of a difference when you're talking about the kinds of resources we're looking at here, okay? You're not gonna do a big dam impoundment. Landfill gas, we've already got a landfill gas set here where we take methane that's produced naturally from the Lincoln landfill, use it to generate about five megawatts of electricity all year round, but that's everything the landfill has given us. If the landfill can give us a little bit more methane in a few years, well, then we'll use that to create a little bit more electricity, but we're not gonna include it in here because LES isn't gonna go and build landfill gas projects in other people's service territories. That doesn't happen. Marilyn, do you have a question? I do, I wanna go back to you. Okay, good question. So what Marilyn asked about is, does the EIA have a different definition of geothermal than what we use like in the Lincoln Public Schools? Or did you know it or not, this building, this building's 100% geothermal, okay? Two different things. So when we talk about this building being geothermal, we have geothermal heat pumps that are using the ground like a heat source or a heat sink, right? And then they circulate water and we're using that for heating and cooling. This is geothermal for electricity production. If you go out to places like California, they actually can tap warm steam from down below the Earth's crust, bring it up, and they use it to make electricity. It is the coolest thing ever. You just can only do that in a few places where that heat is up to where you can capture it, all right? And last one, offshore wind, okay? Everybody here is from, everybody in the room from Nebraska? at least currently. Okay, come on, raise your hands because I know at least most of you are from Nebraska, all right. We don't have any oceans bias, right? 
And we don't have any Great Lakes. There are people talking about doing offshore wind in the Great Lakes, but neither of those apply to us, so we take those out. All right, now we got to get a little more technical. So Aegeus, that software we use, it has a built-in screening functionality where it says, you know what, you can take all your non-dispatchable resources and I will vary their capacity factor. Remember how much they run over the course of the year from 10% to 100% in 10% increments, 10%, 20, 30 on up. And I'll give you its total cost. You have to build it, you got to operate all that stuff for a given year. And I'm going to divide it by its nameplate size. So I'll give you a dollar per KW. And what you do is you compare those, all right? Because if something doesn't have a very good price over that entire range, it doesn't guarantee it won't get picked in the dynamic programming process, but it probably won't. So that's what we use for the screening function. So what we do, when we do the screening function, remember we got that grid, 10 by 10 natural gas prices and CO2 prices, right? So what we do is we run for the four corners, the lowest gas price and the lowest CO2 price, lowest gas and highest CO2, highest gas and lowest CO2, and then highest gas and highest CO2. All four corners and compare all that to see what we should take out, all right? So the first thing, we're looking for the things that are always in the top two highest cost. Biomass, burning wood, and fuel cells, okay? I will tell you, biomass is in the top two highest cost things like all the time. It's almost always the highest cost one, just not cost effective. Most of that's the fuel. And then fuel cells, okay? So those come off the board. Now we're gonna use the same Aegeus functionality, but we're gonna do pairs of similar dispatchable resources. We're gonna try and filter those down. We don't need, we don't have room to have two things that are exactly almost the same. So for example, we've got two nuclear options up there. One is light water reactor, which is everybody think you're a traditional nuclear plant. That's what they're talking about there, right? The other one, small modular nuclear reactors. Everybody's talking about these. They're really cool. They can be small, supposedly take a lot less staff. They don't commercially exist yet, but the EI has numbers for them. So we compared those. And what we said is, if one of them's more expensive than the other one, most of the time, then we're gonna take out the expensive one. Small modular nuclear reactors were most of the time the most expensive. So we're gonna take those off. Okay, so again, why did I do that? Because I want nuclear to have the best chance of getting picked. So I'm gonna keep its lowest cost option over most of the futures, okay? Next one, two types of combustion turbines, natural gas combustion turbines. One is called an aeroderivative. That's like a, basically just another version of what sits on the wing of an airplane. That's at LES's Terry Bundy generating station on the northeast side of town. The other one is industrial frame, usually larger units, a little heavier. Those are at LES's Rokeby generation station, southwest part of town. So we compared all those, the industrial frames fall away. So we keep the aero derivatives. Why is that? The aero derivatives are more efficient. So they usually play out better over the long term. Then we had natural gas. The EIA did what they call base and peak distributed generation. These are small units, like about three megawatts. Base is a little weird. We don't have many of those around here. This would be a natural gas generator that's three megawatts that just runs all the time. You ever seen like a backup generator? This is kind of what thing we're talking about here, but it runs off natural gas. Peaking makes a little more sense. Those only run when the load needs them the most, okay? We compare those to a reciprocating internal combustion engine. Similar type thing, runs on natural gas, but these are about 18 megawatts in size. So we compared all three of them. What you find is the three megawatt ones go away. We keep the 18 megawatt reciprocating engine. Final step, we're gonna compare non-dispatchable resources that are similar, and we're gonna see if something always has a higher construction cost and higher operations and maintenance costs, probably not gonna get picked. And the ones we're comparing here are solar photovoltaics, solar PV, so the panels, built with four hour lithium ion battery storage. It's just having a solar PV and a battery storage project, but you built them at the same site. So you get economies of scale. Versus solar thermal. Solar thermal, if anybody's seen the pictures, what they do is they, these are usually out in the desert. They set a big ring of mirrors, lots of mirrors, have a big collector station in the middle, direct all that solar power concentrated back to that collector station. 
This particular one, the EIA modeled, has eight hours of storage. There's usually like a lot of times a molten salt in that collector station. They can store the heat, eight hours of storage. So we compared those. Solar thermal costs way more to build up front and way more to operate. Now, the one catch here is it's eight hour storage. And the battery we're looking at with the solar PV is only four hour storage. So you'd think that'd be an advantage, but I will tell you the solar thermal costs so much more that you can afford to add a whole four hour, another four hour battery to that solar PV bus battery, which would give you eight hours and you're still way cheaper than the solar thermal. All right. There is your list of resources. Phil. Scott, what solar thermal battery storage? Do you look at other types of batteries lithium? So the EIA only modeled lithium ion batteries, and there's a reason for that because that's almost all that's out there in the industry. There are other technologies being worked with. They're not very prevalent though. Lithium ions kind of corner the market with this size. So you see a lot of lead acid batteries for typical just backup battery things, not for battery storage. They can't compete technically. Gone. The battery situation is a little bit tricky because the cost of batteries are going down very rapidly with the mile. Yep. So what Don just talked about is the battery price of lithium ion changing all the time down. Right. And that's going to continue. Because the more of them that go in, that's lithium ion has an advantage because there's a lot of them going in for cars. So the utility industry kind of rides their coattails. Don, did you have a question? You knocked off small nuclear reactors too quickly for me to get my question out. Oh, OK. I keep hearing this from the power industry. But our United States Navy has been running on nuclear since 1957. Now, <clears throat> you'll get the picture. You can't do this. But what's wrong with pulling up one of those decommissioned nuclear submarines up the Platte River and throwing a cable over to Grand Island? So you're about, I don't know, the 10 millionth person that has asked me this question. Usually they're not as nice as you. Thank you. Usually they're like, come on, you're telling me we can build a nuclear plant in a tin box under the surface of the ocean, but you can't figure out how to do the same type thing on a small size up on the ground. Uh, but it's getting worked on. There's a lot of time and money going into these. Unfortunately, the costs are still high. Why are they still high? Because they don't really commercially exist yet. There's not a lot of them out there. They do not have the same things going for them that Don mentioned with batteries. The hope with small modular nuclear reactors, someday they actually exist. And when they exist and you can commercially buy them, more and more go in, and then you should see the price go down rather quickly. But that is not the case today. OK, so you take this. There's a clean set. That's all the resources that are going to be in our little mix here. OK. I've given you the name plate size. I've also given you the number that we let the model have. And then finally, at the end, we've got an abbreviation. Those aren't that big a deal. But we're going to use those all the way throughout when we start looking at the results. OK, those are all the new options. We're going to add to that two more things. One is LES's own sustainable energy program. That is our umbrella of existing energy efficiency and demand response programs. So if you've ever gotten money to put in a more efficient air conditioner, something like that, do better insulation, that was from the SCP. Our requirements under the IRP from the Western Area Power Administration, WAPA, that's who we have our hydro contract with, and they require us every five years to do an IRP. They say you have to evaluate supply side resources, all those new things, against demand side resources like energy efficiency. So every five years, we throw the SCP in the mix and say, are we going to continue the SCP? Is it worth doing or would you be better off not deferring that load and just building new generation? That's why it's on the list. The last one is adding 90% efficient carbon capture and sequestration to one of our existing coal resources. Walter Scott 4 sits right across the river in Iowa by Council Bluffs. That is our newest coal resource relative to the other ones. So if you were going to make some kind of an expenditure like this, it makes sense that it'd probably be on the newest one. All right. Also, per at least the modeling data, the most efficient. So it makes sense there as well. All right. That's all the stuff we're going to dump into this model and see what it spits out. Now we're going to talk about the results. Now here's the part that I'm going to apologize for up front because this is 
we got to go down in the weeds to talk about this stuff. All right. If it doesn't make sense, you ask a question. If it still doesn't make sense, we're moving on. This isn't like no man left behind. We're leaving you. All right. Uh, because we got it. We can't be here all night. But honestly, as we go through this, we're going to talk at the end. If this doesn't make sense to you, there is no reason you can't reach out to me. You can do that directly if you know me. If not, you can go to the website, las.com slash IRP. There's a link on there to send an email. It's going to come to me, and we can sit down and go through this stuff because this is not the kind of stuff that really sinks in the first time you've seen it, okay? It's just different, but we're going to do our best. Okay, so real, pri real quick primer on the results here. What we're going to do is we're going to color code these for you. All right, we got, remember we got that grid of 100 squares. We're going to show you in each one of those the first time we picked a resource, and we're going to color code it. The earlier it got picked is a darker color, green for additions, browns for retirements. The lighter color means it happened later in the period. Why does that matter? We put more stock in the things that are picked early than the ones that are picked late. And I'll tell you why. Remember when we said we're going to pick resources for 20 years, from 2022 to 2041, but then we also include their costs in a 30-year extension period to make sure we cover financing, we capture all that debt. In that extension period, the model makes two simplifications. Number one, it assumes no new load growth. Load just stays flat for 30 years. Number two, it makes no new resource decisions. If something retires, it replaces it with the exact same thing. All right. It's just a way to speed up the process so it captures most of the dollars, but it's not quite as perfect as the first 20 years. Well, so here's the problem with that. When the model goes to add a resource in 2038, 2039, 2040, especially 2041, it says, hey, uh, I might need five megawatts for the next year, but once I hit 2041 after that, the world's just gonna go static and the load's never gonna go up. So instead of picking the best lowest cost resource for the long term, it tends to want to build the smallest thing possible to just get past 2041 and then nothing to ever do again, all right? Does that make sense to everybody, okay? This is just like my kids in homework. Do the least amount possible if you don't think the teacher is going to ask for anything more. All right, that's what this is doing, okay? Remember, it's more important to get picked early than it is to get picked late. But getting picked late is better than not getting picked at all. Okay? I told our board this is just like when you're a kid in elementary school playing dodgeball. Everybody wanted to be the first kid picked. You certainly didn't want to be the last kick picked, but you didn't want to be the kid that no one picked and the teacher had to put little Bobby on somebody's team. All right. So that's what we're looking at here. So when you get in that IRP report, if you open it for all 100 squares, we have this little table and it tells you what resources were added, what year they were added, how many of them, what resources were retired, what year, and then it gives you three metrics at the bottom. LES is total CO2 emissions and thousands of tons in the year 2040 when our decarbonization goal comes through. The net present value of the cost of the total portfolio in the first 20 years, and then the one that really matters, the net present value cost of our portfolio over 50 years, because that's what we're using to pick the lowest cost plan that we provide you, all right? That's really cool if you wanna look at the details, but I tell you, you can't look at 100 of those and tell anything. So that's where the color-coded tables come from. And that's what those summary tables look like, all right? I got two of them up there for you. Look at resource A, the one on your left. It's got a lot of dark green in the middle. It got picked a lot early in the study period, right? Then it's got a little bit where it got picked later, and it's got a few squares where it didn't get picked at all. Look at resource B. It didn't get picked as much, but where is it? Bright, bright green, down the lower right-hand corner. In the lower right-hand corner is when natural gas prices are the highest, and the regulated price of CO2 is the highest, okay? When we're picking resources, everything is a gamble. You do not know, you have no control over which of those 100 squares are gonna happen in the future. In fact, over the next 20, 30, 40 years of a resource, a lot of those squares are gonna happen. You're gonna flip between them from one year to the next, all right? But you don't control that. So you're trying to pick the resource that gives you the best chance of being successful over the widest range of possible futures. If you could guarantee me that for the next 50 years, we're going to have $10 natural gas and a $90 per ton carbon tax, which resource would I pick? I'd pick resource B because the software told me that was the best one to put in under that scenario. But you know what? If you have lower natural gas prices and lower CO2 prices, 
you're probably going to take a bath financially because that was not the best choice. If you were asking me based on these two, I would take resource A every time because it gives me the best chance to be successful over the widest range of futures. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so the first thing, we had to retire those coal resources, right? Here's the first two, Gerald Gentleman Station Units 1 and 2. Gerald Gentleman Station is an NPPD plant out in western Nebraska. Uh, we have a small participation agreement. We're not an owner. We just kind of share in all the costs and revenues. So look at the brown square show you where it retired. Remember, the darker is the earlier it retired. The first year it could retire something was 2029. Why 2029? Because we had to give the model long enough to build all the different resource options to keep it fair. If we went earlier than 2029, Something like nuclear wouldn't even count because it couldn't build it between now and 2029, all right? So if you notice that, it's retiring it right away when the gas prices are low. You see that? When gas prices are around $1, it's trying to get rid of it whether there's a carbon tax or not. Why is that? Because in the SPP market, if gas prices are low, what do you think the market would rather run? Gas or coal? It wants to run the gas units. So it's telling you, I can't financially compete. That's why for five years in a row, it was below a 20% capacity factor. So we retired it. It also retires, if you notice, when the CO2 prices are high. Why is that? Because coal has a relatively high CO2 emissions to other units, right? It's about twice that of a natural gas unit. It can't afford to put those out and get charged for them. That's why you end up with retirements in the upper right-hand diagonal of the grid. That's Laramie River Station Unit 1. We are a minority owner in this plant. This is out in Wyoming. Same similar type pattern, but what do you notice? It doesn't retire as often as Gerald Gentleman, right? Same shape, but not as often. There's Walter Scott. That's that newest one that's over in Iowa. Again, same thing, but it's less often than even Laramie. The Aegeus model looks at a lot of different things over long term, but you know what it doesn't worry about? The minutia of where these are at, where they're physically located, what the market prices are like there. It simply says, well, I know how efficient these are because you've told me in the modeling data. I know what their operating costs are. I know what their fuel costs are. Whatever one's the cheapest, that's the last one to retire. If I think I got to retire coal, I'm hanging on to the cheapest one the longest. Makes sense. That's what you would do too, right? Well, we tell people all the time, you got to be careful. You don't want to read into this, oh, so that's the order those things should retire. No, this isn't based on real world data. It's SPP's best model data, but that model data, not the same as the real world. We don't really care what order they go in. We're just using this as a proxy so we can throw in coal retirements, so we know when the world will put pressure on coal, so we can see what it would go and build instead. All right? So there's your retirement. So you already know by looking at that where we need to add resources for sure up in that upper right hand diagonal right okay, so we're going to walk through each of the different resource types here everything on the list there's tier one wind i will tell you it's really rare that a resource shows up in all 100 squares why is that because they all got their different places where they work better that's darn close i think it's like 98. i think it's only those top two up in the corner where it doesn't show up really good representation see how there's different colors up there Sometimes it's putting in earlier, sometimes later, right? I will tell you why it's doing it in the terms of wind. We already mentioned we have a large wind resource that retires in 2036 and two more that retire in 2041. Usually what it's doing is in 2036 or around there, it's putting one in to replace the first one. And in 2041 or around there, it's putting a couple in to replace that one. They might happen a little early, they might happen a little later, but what it's doing is it's usually going to replace the wind we already have. There's tier two wind. You went from almost every square covered to no squares covered. Well, we talked about that before. There's a lot of things this software model does that are rocket science. This isn't one of them. You're building the same. I love it when Marilyn laughs at my jokes. Okay. You're building the same resource. You're building a wind resource over here and one over here. They're, let's say they're exactly the same, same cost, same output, same everything. But one SPP said you could count as tier one because you're under your limit and one became tier two. With this one, for every 100 megawatts you built, you get to count 28% of that. So you get 28 megawatts of credit towards meeting your peak load plus 12%. With this other one, you're getting something that's probably less than 10%. The model says, well, I don't like the ones where I only get a little bit. 
I get a much bigger bang for my buck if I build the other ones. Pretty stark contrast, though. There's, yeah. Under their wind model. Okay, so the question was, what kind of climate change assumptions does SPP build into their wind model? I don't know that there are any climate change assumptions in there, Don. I will tell you, every year they update the profile of every wind resource in the entire model. But they're doing that based on looking at what the historical wind has been, not, I don't believe, on projections of what it might be in the future. Okay. Okay, tier one solar, not quite as good as wind, but it shows up a lot. That's pretty good coverage. Because remember, we're not worried about it filling every square. What you're really looking at is, does it fill squares over in this corner? Does it fill them over in this corner? Because wide extreme, if it covers a lot of area, that means it's probably pretty good. There's tier two solar, just like tier two wind, not gonna show up. Why is that? Because tier one gets 57% accreditation. Tier two was down like, I think it was like around 12%. Okay, huge difference. There's tier one batteries. Didn't show up too much. Two things are holding the battery back. One, it's only a four hour duration. Okay, from a reliability standpoint, four hours just doesn't give you that much. But the bigger thing is, in the EIA book, these have a 10 year life. And that's not crazy. Most people will tell you they got a 10 year life. So think about it. We're looking at a 50 year period. If you build a natural gas unit or wind, solar, you're looking at at least a 30 year period product. Some of those are 40, right? This is 10. So you build it and 10 years later, you have to build another one. And 10 years later, you have to build another one. All of a sudden, the costs add up really quickly. All right. If in a five years, we run this again, and there are batteries out there that are more common than four hours, because most everything right now is four hours, and they don't have 10-year products, they're saying we can get these to last for 20 years, you will see those numbers change dramatically. But that's what's holding it back right now. There's the sustainable energy program. Pretty good coverage. Looks similar to solar, right? It didn't fill every square, but man, it pretty much kind of painted in every one of the four quadrants. So that's a pretty good showing for it. Natural gas combustion turbines. This is another thing that's not rocket science. Where'd the model like natural gas combustion turbines? When natural gas is close to free and there's not much of a carbon price. See that? When there's one or two dollar natural gas, heck yeah, I'll run natural gas and I don't have to pay too much for CO2 emissions. As soon as I do, I'm not sure I like those as much. There's natural gas reciprocating engines. I tell folks all the time when you play this, it's kind of like Tetris. Raise your hand if you know what Tetris is. Okay, most people know Tetris. If you notice, take the natural gas combustion turbine green squares and fit them with the green squares for the reciprocating engine, the dark green ones. They fit together, don't they? It's just a different flavor of natural gas. When the carbon price got up a little higher, it flipped to these reciprocating engines because it thought they'd work a little bit better. But for the most part, it's saying if natural gas prices are low, I will use those. But only to a point. CO2 gets high enough, I'm out. There's natural gas combined cycles with carbon capture and sequestration. They get picked a lot, right? And what do they like? They like carbon prices because they're insulated from most of them because they're capturing 90% of their carbon. But they still top out at a gas price around mid-range, right? They say too high a gas price. I can't price, the fuels price me out. There's brand new coal with 90% carbon capture and sequestration. Not picked that much, but where is it picked? Only a combination of the highest gas prices and the highest CO2 prices. Why is that? It doesn't burn natural gas and it doesn't produce much CO2 that it's not capturing. Coal, new coal with carbon capture and sequestration is very, very, very expensive to build. But in a market with high natural gas and high CO2 prices, its operating costs are very, very low. So it can only afford to spend all the money it needs to build that thing if it thinks over the next 50 years, we're gonna get a lot of money back from the market because we are a very low cost option compared to most or other resources. There's the retrofit of carbon capture and sequestration to our Walter Scott 4 unit. How different is that than the new coal with carbon capture and sequestration? It's a big difference, right? Why is that? There's two reasons for that. When you retrofit to Walter Scott 4, there's two things you don't have to build. You don't have to build the coal plant, it's already there. You gotta do the carbon capture part, 
but not the coal plant. You also don't have to build any of the transmission. It's already got the transmission, all right? So there's two things that work in the favor of a retrofit. Uh, now I provide this caveat that EIA does a great job, but when you're talking about building new coal with carbon capture and especially retrofit with carbon capture to an existing coal plant, I don't put a lot of stock in their estimates on those prices. And why is that? Because there just aren't any of these out there, except for small pilot projects, okay? I'll guarantee you if five years from now you look at the price on wind, solar, natural gas units, they're going to be pretty close to what they are today. Some might go up a little bit, some might go down, but for the most part, EIA knows what those costs are going to be because people have been building them and that's who they talk to. The carbon capture and sequestration prices, I bet they change a lot in five years because as people start to build these and get more into them, they're going to have more data to pull from. And then finally, there's nuclear. Nuclear, same exact boat as new coal with carbon capture and sequestration. Very, very, very expensive to build on the front end. Really low operating costs for the next few decades. You can only afford to do it if the market prices are going to be really high. When gas is the highest, and CO2 prices are the highest. Notice nuclear never shows up other than mostly that lower right-hand quadrant when those two things are true, okay? All right, so you're doing pretty good. So there's last piece then for the base case. We have three metrics, I already told you what they are. That's what our CO2 emissions look like in the year 2040 for our entire portfolio. And that's just a color gradient. So lowest is white, highest is red. All right. Where are they the lowest? In the upper right hand diagonal. What happened in the upper right hand diagonal? That's where we retired all the coal, right? That's why the CO2 emissions are the lowest. So look at the lower right, the lower, sorry, lower left diagonal. That's where we didn't retire the coal. Those CO2 emissions aren't going to work with the decarbonization goal, all right? Again, this isn't rocket science, but what the model's telling you is if you're going to meet the decarb goal, you can't just have all that unmitigated coal. That's not going to work. There's the cost, net present value, in millions of dollars for the first 20 years. And I will tell you, there's the same thing over the 50 years, about the same shapes and colors, okay? If you can read this on the right-hand chart, the 50 years, those range from about two and a half billion dollars to nine and a half billion dollars. That is the cost to LES and all of our customers to construct those units, own and operate those units, and do it in a world where the natural gas and CO2 prices are changing. All right. So big dollars. If you're like me, I have a hard time discerning the difference between two and a half billion and nine and a half billion. They're both so big, I don't. They're just a lot, right? So what we did, mostly for ourselves, and then since it worked, we're going to pass it on to you. We broke it down into terms of what we can understand, rate increases. So we took the lowest cost box, which is up there at the very top, $1 gas, no carbon tax, kind of makes sense. That's the lowest cost. And the highest cost box down in the lower right-hand corner, $10 gas, $90 carbon tax. We said, we want to compare them to our current financial model. Our current financial model was built for the 2022 budget, which means we put it together about this time last year in 2021. When we did that, gas was projected to be, on average, $3 per MMBTU. And is there a regulated value on carbon today? No. So for our purposes, everything LES is modeled financially, we live in that blue box. What we want to know is if we move from that blue box to the lowest and the highest, what's that delta look like? What is that incremental cost? Here's what you get. The rate increases range from a minus 8% to a positive 137%. Okay. Three things are changing when those rates change. One is that the natural gas price is changing. Right, because we remember we're in the blue box, so either it went down or it went way up. The CO2 price is changing from the blue box, okay? At least in one case, the other one has stayed the same. And we retired those coal resources because they weren't financially viable, and we 
built new stuff to replace them. All right, so this is the next 20 years. Those are the rate increases. So to give you a feel for this, on the high end, for the typical residential customer, if everybody was the same average residential customer, it would be per customer. That's an extra $24,000 over the next 20 years. For an industrial customer, that's an extra, make sure I get them right, $58 million over the next 20 years. That's Now, why do I call that incremental? Because anything that was already in LES's financial model, which I believe has a 14% rate increase over the next 20 years is what our financial model has, that's not in there. So any money we're going to spend on other things like transmission, facilities, staff, I like when we spend on staff, okay? When you do those kinds of things, they're in there. This is just on top of that. This is only the changes in what the gas price and CO2 price does to our portfolio's performance, and then we retired coal plants and we replaced them. Okay. Why do we show you this? These numbers have huge ramifications, right? That's a big difference to our customers. So when you look at all these things, the mob that makes you can kind of fall into a trap of, hey, there's this neat square and look at the colors. Just remember that as you move around that square and you make resource decisions, these carry huge ramifications. Okay. How are we doing on time? All right. Done. Sorry, so not done. Can Seriously, and said that was the most important factor. Where would we probably end up on that grid? So, if society said carbon, climate change is the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. Took it seriously. What well, you'd be over on the right-hand column, probably somewhere with a somewhere with a ninety dollar per ton carbon tax. I will tell you. Uh, we didn't just come up with that range by happenstance. If you go into, it's not permanent, they call it interim, but the US EPA's interim social cost of carbon. When we run that range from zero to 90, at 90, we're above what they come up with. They have three different ways they do the calculation. We're above that, but not much. We basically encompass their ranges. Okay, so we're kind of covering the board there. And so that would be, you'd be on that far end is where you'd end up, okay? All right, we got a number of sensitivities. We're not gonna be able to do all of these. That's okay, that means we're having a good discussion. But here's the sensitivity cases we're in. Now remember, when we run a sensitivity, what we do is we take that base case, 100 cases, and we just tweak one thing, because we wanna see what's that one thing do? Maybe sometimes it's two. So we change our resources. One of the ones we ran is, what if there's no such thing as carbon capture and sequestration in the next 20 years? Why would I say that? Because commercially it's not available. You can't buy one today. If you wanted to, you can't. I don't know if that's gonna change in the near future or not. We hope, but we don't know. So we take that out. Then I took out nuclear. And a lot of you are saying, well, that's dumb because I know you can build a nuclear plant. Yes, you can. But LES, we're too small utility to build our own nuclear plant. We're gonna have to partner with somebody if we're gonna do it. Just like we've never built our own coal plant. We're a minority stakeholder in those, right? So if you've got to partner with somebody, what that means is you don't control when and if it's gonna happen. So you've got to hope that someone builds one and you got to hope that they're looking for partners and you got to hope that you actually want to partner with them. All right. Doesn't mean it can't happen. There's just no guarantees. So we took that out as well. Last thing is remember we talked about, we had the hybrid solar and the battery. We did not include that in the base case because we wanted to see how solar and battery did on their own. But now we bring it together and dump it in and say, how much does that help things? Then we changed with retirements. He said, you know what, one of the things we're going to look at is retiring all the coal in 2029. We're not going to do this capacity factor thing. We're just going to get rid of all of it in 2029. Then we said, what if we just got rid of one resource in 2029, the oldest coal resource that we have ownership in, Laramie River Station, the one in Wyoming. And then finally, we said, what if we got rid of all of our natural gas in 2029? Okay. And then we changed a bunch of different model assumptions. One is we said, man, we did a high range of gas prices from $1 to $10, but what if they went higher? So we ran 100 cases from $6 to $15 on gas, okay? We also said, what if there's electrification in the Southwest Power Pool to the point that their load grows a ton, but it doesn't just grow, it grows in different times of the year, and they and LES become a winter peaking utility. Right now we peak in the summer. This time of day, a little bit earlier, five o'clock-ish, six o'clock-ish, we're gonna hit our peak in the summer, July or August. Under this model, we're doing that in January and February because there is more room to grow with electricity in the winter 
than there is in the summer because in the summer the biggest load is air conditioning and we already kind of own the market on that what we don't have is a lot of building heat and that can really move that up spp i've been telling you that spp says you got an extra add an extra 12 percent you got enough accredited generation but your peak load plus 12 percent right 12 percent reserve margin so three weeks before we had to present this to our board which was about one week ago today spp changed that and said, starting next year, it's not 12%, it's 15%. Uh, and I, we cried a little bit because how we were going to, and for about one day, we entertained that we're going to rerun everything. Uh, I will tell you, when we run these cases, it takes about three days to run one of these. And then if we make a mistake, then we fix it and it takes three more days, right? Uh, so we decided real quick, that's not going to work. But what we could do is run a sensitivity take the base case and change it to 15% and see if it changes the results. I will tell you, it didn't, so we felt pretty good. Our results are still reflective. And the last one, Ken, remember I just told you we cried because SPP changed the rules three weeks before this was due, right? Less than three days before it was due, the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act. And so what we did is we were able to run that and put a sensitivity in to see what the impacts were, all right? I'll show you that one. We're going to have to, I had three of them. We're going to have to skip one of them. I'll show you the coal one. Okay, so here on the top, you've got the base case. That was those coal retirements we already looked at. The bottom row, that's the coal retirements and the sensitivity, not rocket science. We're just taking all of them out in 2029, right? That's what we're comparing. I'm not going to show you every resource here for simplicity. I'm only showing you the ones that change a lot. They all change. When you have 100 squares and you change one of these assumptions, there is always a change in at least one square. All right. But I'm showing you the ones that change the most. So the first thing we've got over there on your left, natural gas combustion turbines. When we retire all the coal, our software model says, gosh, guys, I got to have enough accredited generation to meet my peak load plus an extra 12%. You just took hundreds of megawatts from me. I got to get some stuff put in. And so it puts in natural gas combustion turbines as long as what? The CO2 price is relatively low. As the CO2 price goes up, what did it switch to? Natural gas combined cycle with 90% carbon capture and sequestration. Look at coal CCS, coal with carbon capture and sequestration. That expanded. It still lives in the same general area, but it has more growth now, right? Because it needs more resources. And then look at nuclear. That's the big one. Now it says I'll build nuclear as long as the gas price is high enough. So the market price is high. I can afford to build it, but I'll do that for all prices of CO2. So here's those metrics I told you about. Look at the CO2 one. Okay, don't get hung up on the red squares because they're just based on what the min and max is. The red squares on there are a four. It's only 4,000 tons. 4,000 tons is not very much when you're talking about the whole portfolio. It's basically break even. So if you take out those red squares, what's that show you? Well, if we got rid of all the coal, up in the upper right where we retired it anyway, in the base case, remember? Well, there's no change because we retired it before for economics. But in the lower left hand, there's a reduction in CO2 because we got rid of all the coal resources. Then you look at the dollars. Over the 20 year period, they're mostly all an increase except for the lower right. Over the 50 year period, a lot more that went down in the lower right. I will tell you, if you decide to actually dig through the report, and you're all nice people, I really, I hesitate to even tell you to think about digging through the report. I mean, you ever taken medication that says don't operate heavy machinery when this, don't ever operate heavy machinery when reading this report? All right. It's terribly mind numbing. But if you do and you want to know why these things happen in the lower right hand corner, you follow the nuclear. Remember, in the lower right hand corner, the report picked a lot of nuclear. Nuclear costs a lot of money to build. But over a long term, you get it back because it's low operating costs. That's why our costs went down in the lower right hand corner. It built a ton of nuclear and it came out cheaper in the long run. OK. So we did our rate comparison again, took the two extremes. The rate increases now, this is only by 2029. Why 2029? Because we retired all the coal in 2029. 
So you got to build replacement generation. All right. The rate increases go from zero to 62 percent. From now to 2029. Why zero? Because remember, if we were going to retire the coal for economic reasons, when we force the retirement in the same year, no impact, right? But if we force the retirement in a year where it wasn't retired for economic reasons, then we have up to a 62% increase. What's that mean? It means $2,300 for a typical residential customer, 5.6 million for a typical industrial customer. Remember, those are incremental costs. What that means now is they don't include buildings and staff and transmission. It's only power costs. And this is in addition to the increases we saw in the base case. Remember the minus eight to like 137%? This is on top of that is how these work, all right? You can tell when you're looking at these coal retirements, boy, you wanna make the right decision because there's a lot of money on the line. You do it too late and they'll bleed you dry because they're losing money. You do it too early, you're gonna get rid of a resource that's working well financially, replace it with something that's not gonna work as well financially and you had to spend the money to build it. The timing is everything with those, okay? For time purposes, I'm gonna flip to this one. This was natural gas, very similar. Last one, and these are all in the report. You can look at all this stuff, is the Inflation Reduction Act, okay? Coal retirement's exactly the same. Why is that? Because here's what we modeled in the Inflation Reduction Act. There is a new clean electricity investment tax credit that anything you build that doesn't produce carbon, so wind, solar, nuclear, and they're applying it to battery storage, even though it doesn't really have a fuel, you get 30% of your initial capital construction costs back in terms of a tax credit. Or, very new thing that we're excited about. If you're utility like LES, that's a government entity that doesn't pay income tax, we can get that back as a direct payment. We get, it, we get the same dollars, okay? So what we did is we took those four resources, wind, solar, nuclear, and battery, and we just cut 30% off their initial construction costs from the EIA, all right? Technically, we should have done something kind of similar for carbon capture and sequestration. There's an existing, they call it a 45Q credit for carbon capture and sequestration. The Inflation Reduction Act extends, supposed to expire, extends that out, actually makes it more lucrative. We did not apply that because I don't know how. Because I don't know if we're the person putting in the plant that's producing the carbon, but we're gonna capture it. But then someone else has to build the pipeline that takes the carbon and somebody else has to build the big hole in the ground you're gonna stick it in. I don't know how that credit gets divvied up amongst those entities. So we said to keep from messing it up, we're just not gonna model it, okay? There's what changed. Wind got picked before all the time. Now it gets picked all the time and it gets picked a lot earlier. You know why that is? Because the clean electricity investment tax credit expires in 2032. This is one of those things that's not rocket science. The model said, well, gosh, if you're gonna give me money for wind 30% off through 2032, I might hurry up and build it early instead of waiting until I actually need it. Okay, makes sense. Coal CCS mostly went off the board. Why is that? Because I didn't adjust the price for coal CCS. Other things got cheaper. And the last one is nuclear. Nuclear had a 30% cost reduction, so it fills more of that kind of what we'll call the lower right diagonal, all right? Here's the metrics. Look at CO2. What would you think CO2 should do? I, it should go down right? CO2 emissions should go down because I lowered the price of wind, solar, nuclear, and batteries, things that don't make CO2. So it puts in more of the things that don't make CO2. And look, there's a few cases where this carbon emissions actually went up. Not very much, but they went up. We thought that was broke. I thought that was broke. And then the guys showed me it wasn't broke. You know what happened there? That's all because of the carbon capture and sequestration upgrade on Walter Scott 4. Because the, the non-CO2 emitting resources got so cheap, it put those in earlier and more often. And it delayed the Walter Scott 4 upgrade until later in the period. So what that means is in 2040, Walter Scott 4 
was putting out a little bit more CO2 in this case than it did in the base case because it didn't get upgraded until 2041. It's not a huge number, but it's kind of an interesting thing. You wouldn't have thought that would happen. Look at the cost over the first 20 years, things jump around, but remember what we're looking at, we're picking plans off the last, the 50 years. And since we lowered the cost of all those resources, you would think all the costs of our cases should go down and they did. Everything's a blue box. Everything got cheaper. Okay. We've just went through all the study results and everything. Okay, Marilyn, yes. Solar didn't change that much. So Marilyn asked, what about solar? Solar didn't change that much. Even with the tax credit, it still got, well, it still got picked a lot and the squares changed and everything. It's just, it wasn't really that dramatic. One of the reasons it wasn't that dramatic is you know what stole a lot of its thunder? Wind. The wind got so much better that the model built more wind and a little bit less solar in some cases. So the solar was not a big difference. We expected it to be different, but it wasn't. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we take everything we learn from running all those cases and we have to apply it to figure out what is our preliminary plan for reaching our decarbonization goal. You made it through the worst part, all right? This is when you kind of tap yourself, wake up. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, here's our decarb goal. We're supposed to achieve net zero CO2 production from our total portfolio by 2040. Net zero means we do not have to get to zero. We just got to get close enough that we can offset the remainder, all right? You get close enough that maybe you're going to plant trees. Probably not going to plant trees because it take too many trees, but that's kind of the idea, right? Now, the path and pace to which we do that, the board says that's going to be bound by a bunch of things. And in summary, we're going to maintain low costs and we're going to maintain high reliability. We're going to continue pursuing environmental stewardship. That means we're not going to make problems trying to fix CO2. Mike still on? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> Four hours. All right. Uh, we also got to be wary of our existing contracts, right? We got to make sure we honor those. And then we need technology to come on. We've talked about some of the stuff that we're hoping to come, but isn't here yet today. So here's how we're going to look at this. This is a column that shows you the accredited generation that LES will have from today's portfolio in 2041. Notice the wind is green. There's no wind on there, okay? That's because remember our existing contracts, the way they're written by 2041, they all go away. All right. Doesn't mean they can be extended, but on paper, they all go away. The red line is our peak load plus 15% SPP's new reserve margin. So this is legal eagle, 15%. Okay. We got just enough, right? But just a little bit to spare based off our latest projections. Okay. So how are we going to do this in 2041? First thing's coal. I showed you the sensitivity. We looked at the numbers. Timing is going to be everything. We are going to have to look for the places to either phase out our coal or upgrade them with something like carbon capture and sequestration if it's actually commercially available. And the timing is going to be everything. You do that too late, they're going to be a financial boat anchor because you should have got rid of them. The world was telling you to get rid of them and they're dragging you down. You do that too early, you're going to build something else that doesn't even perform as well as the thing you got rid of. Okay. The timing is going to be everything with that. We got to be smart enough to identify when one of them should go away because of what's going on in the world. And then we got to be brave enough to take that step. It's going to be hard to do because those resources have anchored our cost and our reliability for a long time. But they got to go away. Otherwise, you can't achieve that goal. Either go away or they got to get mitigated. Next thing. We're going to maintain our existing natural gas fleet. Our natural gas fleet over the last five years, since the last IRP, has accounted for 5% of our total CO2 emissions. That's on an annual basis. Every year is right around 5%. Why is that? Remember we talked about capacity factor, how much a unit runs? Our aggregate generation fleet over the last five years has hit a 5% capacity factor. They're almost never on. You know when they're on? When the SPP market needs them for financial reasons or reliability reasons. And when the market needs you for financial reasons, you know what that means? It means they're on the cusp of needing you for reliability reasons, okay? 
we're going to keep those. Now, they're not going to last forever. I don't even know for sure if we can keep them because some of them are going to get kind of old. What we hope to do is keep them into the 2040s because we're going to have enough things to do and build in the next 20 years. We love it if those gas resources could last into the 2040s so we can kind of spread things out a little bit. All right. I will tell you, when we get done with this, you will see keeping those gas resources makes all this kind of come together. That's our hydro contract with the Western Area Power Administration. That runs through 2050, so that's going to be there. The little orange line, that's our landfill gas with the city. That's only five megawatts. If for some reason that goes away, maybe they find something better to do with the landfill gas. That's okay. Five megawatts isn't going to upset the ship, right? But if we can keep it, we're going to keep it. If there's a way to expand it, we're going to expand it. But it's always going to be a small sliver, but we got it in there. We're going to keep the sustainable energy program. All right, I showed you some of the results from the base case, a little bit of the sensitivities. The sustainable energy program does a good job. It's a hedge against the cost of adding this generation. You say, you know what, instead of building generation, I'm going to keep the load down so I don't even have to build it. It did well, so we're going to continue that. That's everything that's existing. Everything there is all stuff that we already have. It's all going to be there in 2041. Cross your fingers. We're going to maintain our tier one wind. Remember the stuff that gets the highest priority from SPP. Why do I say maintain? Because we're going to, we have over tier one now. It's just when things go away, we're going to backfill and replace them. It may not be in the exact same year. When that one resource retires in 2036, you know what? We might put in something earlier to make sure we get the tax credit or the equivalent of the tax credit. Maybe there's something else going on in the world. And you say it's for some reason, it's better to build it two years later. That's okay. It doesn't have to be in the exact same year, but the point is by 2040, we want that tier one bucket to be full. What we're not going to do is we're not going to do tier two wind or tier three wind. The model didn't like those and it makes sense. You're spending the same amount of money for a lot less return when you look at the accredited capacity. Next, we're going to fill our bucket up with tier one solar. Okay, we don't have that today. We have the little community solar project. Our bucket at this point is 167 megawatts. We're going to make sure we put that in. We don't have solar on the board right now. It worked really well in the results. What we're not going to put in is tier two or tier three solar. And when I say tier one's 167, you're not going to go out and build exactly 167.0, right? You might be a little lower. You might be a little higher, but that's what you're shooting for is you kind of want to be around that number, okay? That leaves 200 megawatts. And I'll, you're going to think this sounds weird, but I'm going to tell you our very best plan is to say, and I don't know what that's going to be. The worst thing I could do is sit up here and tell you what we're going to do, because we don't know. That could be batteries. That could be nuclear. That could be some kind of fossil fuel with carbon capture and sequestration. That could be something we haven't even talked about yet because it doesn't really exist. Maybe somebody makes the equivalent of a natural gas unit, but it runs off hydrogen or some other low CO2 fuel. That's what the other 200 megawatts is going to be. And that's okay. We're going to have to figure it out at some point. But for right now, we're going to leave that open. I will tell you what this plan does. There's a lot of people. Whether you believe in the goal or not, because we have customers on both sides. I get people on both sides that say, I like the goal and I don't like the goal. And both of them sometimes will say, how are you going to do that? Because that could be impossible. Look at that chart right there. Does that look impossible? What we've just done with this plan is we've made the impossible possible. That's doable. And you know why that's doable? Because we can all visualize 200 megawatts. When you tell me redo your entire portfolio, that's hard. But when you show me that and say, come up with what you're going to do for the final 200, I don't know what it's going to be, but that we'll be able to figure out. So we feel pretty good about this preliminary plan to walk forward. Okay. Last thing for you, we're going to pound this out. We've looked at all the study results. We've seen how that fits into our decarbonization plan. Now, what's going to be our action plan for the next five years? First thing, we've seen that solar looked really well on the results, so much so that we made it a big part of the decarbonization plan, right? Tier one solar. Now, right now, if you need to build a resource in the Southwest Power Pool, you have a problem because if you want to build a resource, you got to go ask them permission to hook up to their system. They'll hook anybody up, but they're going to tell you what it costs from running a big study, and that can be a lot 
of dollars, like a couple hundred million dollars in some cases, depending on where you're at. So you have to know what that cost is before you pull the trigger on building your plant. And right now they're running three to four years behind. It's a bad time to have to build generation. The good news is we don't have to build generation right now. So we could pursue something like a solar project because we know you're not going to be able to build it in the very near term because of SPP's issues. I'm going to skip there. I'm going to tell you, so what we've got in here is that we're going to pursue doing a solar project and we're going to look at contracting for it, just like we've contracted for our solar and wind in the past, but that's not the first thing we're looking at. The first thing we're looking at is we want to build it and we want to own it because we think we'll do a better job than a developer will because we're catering exactly to us. Our develop, don't get me wrong, our developer partners do a great job, but they have more to worry about than our stake in the market. They have other concerns and you can't fault them. Profit, those kinds of things. We think we can do better if we just do it directly. That's what we do for electric utility. Before the Inflation Reduction Act came out, where we could take direct claim of the 30% tax credit, this proposal was exactly the same. What I was prepared to come in and tell you just over a week ago was that the current tax credit for solar is only 10%. And if we contract through a third party developer, we're paying all their costs plus profit. And what's a good guess for profit? 10%. So you know what? We're probably breaking even. So we were going to pursue doing our own solar project and just break even. Now we're going to pursue doing our own solar project and have it be 30% less. Hopefully if everything you hear about the Inflation Reduction Act is true, okay? Battery storage pilot. We launched a request for proposals for battery storage project about this time last year. We thought we'd have the contract done, executed before the IRP ever got this far. Uh, we have not. Supply chain issues have made doing contracts difficult. And then it's a high class problem, but the Inflation Reduction Act has changed things, made it hard to finalize things for good reasons. So that's still out there. So what we said is, you know what? It's going to be kind of dumb to come out with an IRP or a plan for the next five years and then announce this cool battery project within a month or two, hopefully. Uh, so we've put that in the IRP. We're going to do that battery project. The thing that makes this battery project neat, there might be a lot of things when we talk about it publicly, hint, hint, but one of the things that makes it cool is it's in the middle of LES's community microgrid. Raise your hand if you have heard of LES's community microgrid. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. Raise your hand if you're not or have ever been LES staff, if you haven't heard about the community microgrid. All right, that's a better count then, thank you. So for all of you who didn't raise your hand, this is LES community microgrid. This is an area right in the middle of downtown Lincoln. If you notice what is served down there, city county buildings, Lincoln Police Department, county sheriff, state office building, state capitol, federal building, the arena. People always ask me, why is the arena in there? Look around the country. Unfortunately, when there's natural disasters, what do they tell you? If you need help, you need a roof over your head, where do you go? You go to the arena, right? It's got a lot of support infrastructure, gas stations, pharmacy, radio tower, grocery store, all down in this area. The idea is if something bad ever, and this is bad, probably not going to happen, knock on wood. But if it does, what you're looking at is some kind of natural disaster, most likely, that cuts a lot of Lincoln off from the regional electricity grid and from our two large local natural gas stations, one that sits in the far northeast corner of town, one in the far southwest corner of town. If that would happen, there's a J Street generator up there listed with 29 megawatts. That unit sits right in the middle of this. It's dual fuel capable, natural gas and oil, which is stored on site in a tank. It's capable ever since it was born, about the same age as me back in the early 1970s. It can come up and run isolated from the grid. It can start on its own. It can perform just like the grid was there, but it's really playing the role of the grid, it does all that. It's the straw that makes this whole thing go. Then it's also supported by over 300 kW of customer owned solar and 500 kW of customer owned thermal energy storage. That's got a duration of six hours. And what we're looking to add to that is LES's battery storage project, okay? If we ever have a day where we have to use the community microgrid, that is probably, unfortunately, the darkest day in Lincoln's history. And what that's going to let us do is power up and have lights and infrastructure down in this area of town 
So all of these city, county, state leaders can start to try to get things moving and bring normalcy back for everybody. All right. So that's why we're kind of excited about the battery storage project. It's going to be size smaller, so it's pilot. But one of the cool benefits is it supports the microgrid. All right, back to where we were at. So to that end, we would love to see more resources down in that community microgrid. It strengthens the microgrid and it gives our battery storage project more things to play with. So we're going to pursue putting more solar down in that area. I don't know what this is going to look like. There's a bazillion ways to do it. OK, we're not talking humongous. The other solar project we talked about before, that's big, right? This one, this is not megawatts. This is hundreds of KW because you're trying to stick it in the middle of downtown. But that's what we're going to pursue. How is it going to be done? I don't know. We'll figure that out. The nice thing about the IRP, it's a lot of work, but you don't have to actually know how you're going to do anything. All right. We'll figure that out later. This one's not a surprise. We're going to continue the sustainable energy program. It did really well on the test, so much so we said that is definitely a part of our decarb goal for what we see right now today. So we're going to continue that program and we're going to grow it where we can cost effectively. And what that means is we're going to add a couple of things. Okay, we worked with the consultants as a precursor to the IRP, review everything, make sure our assumptions are good, our modeling is good with regards to the SEP and its cost benefit analysis. One of the things they did is they said, you know what, here's all the things around the country you could consider doing that other people are doing that you're not. It's not a very big list, but they told us you're doing most of the stuff. But here's two of them. One was high efficiency commercial kitchen equipment. Uh, dishwash, Mark, what were they? Steam cooker, dishwashers. Combination of it. There you go. So we ran the numbers on that based on the consultants estimates. And you know what? These do look good. They look like they're pretty good from a cost benefit standpoint. So Mark and company are going to start offering incentives for those starting next year already. Another thing they mentioned. Doing demand response with hot water heaters. Okay, how many people have heard of peak rewards? Our smart thermostat program. Try to keep your air conditioner from running over our peak, right? This is trying to do the same thing, but with hot water heaters. So we ran the numbers on that. They were terrible. OK, benefit cost was bad. So we can't do a program, but we could do a pilot because we don't know that the consultants estimates actually are good estimates for this part of the country. So what we have done is we have partnered with Hoppy Development on the new Gatehouse Rose project that's going in by Wayuka Cemetery, OK, right by Kurt's house. And they've got 98 units there. They were already putting in electric resistance hot water heaters. What we're doing is paying them to change them to smart electric water heaters so that we can control them, try to keep them from running so much over our peak without the customers knowing. And maybe, maybe, because nobody's really doing this yet, when we see market prices are really low or even negative when you get paid for having load, turn them on before they would need to and heat the water. So we're going to try that uh, starting next year. Last one. They said, you know, you could do some kind of critical peak pricing time of use. What that means is you vary the price of electricity to try to push people to use it when it's the cheapest and best for LES, not use it so much when it's the most expensive and most importantly, when it's on your peak, which leads us to build more generation. We've known about this. These have been around for a long time. The problem here at LES is if you look at the residential, all your homes are running, our residential rates are so low that you can't create enough differential between a low price time and a high price time to get people to do what you want. Relatively speaking, it's pretty cheap either way. Where we could potentially make up some ground though and influence people is with our larger customers that are on demand rate, large commercial and industrial customers. We had started looking at this about a year ago, a little over, um, because we were talking to a potential large customer that was interested in this. We said, you know, that might be a pretty good idea. And then the consultant came out uh, about this time last year. We first started engaging with them, and they said, this is something you might want to look at. So we kind of picked up speed, uh, and we've been working on this because we knew this was coming. And so next year, 2023, we're going to offer this rate. We'll have to see how many of our large industrial customers can practically change their process to do it. But it looks like we can give them enough cost difference to influence those changes. This is my last slide. So you made it all the way through and we made it with, okay, we're four minutes over, dang it. Um, 
back to the timeline, all right? We've made it all the way through all the analysis. Now we're in the customer Q&A part. This is just the start of that. If you go through this and you want to ask questions, you call, you send an email, all right? You want to come in and talk about it by yourself, you let me know, you come in and we'll talk about it. You want me to come and talk to you, I'll come out and we'll bring the report and we'll talk about it, all right? If you've got a group, which is even better, of folks that you get together and you're all interested, then let us know, get us on the agenda for one of your meetings, set a special meeting, we'll come out, I don't care when it is, at night, on the weekend, whatever works for you, and we'll go through all this, okay? We're gonna do that for the next two months because in October, I think it's the 21st, yep, October 21st, the LES board is gonna take action on approving this. The entire IRP is out on our website at les.com slash IRP. What you'll notice on, I would have, I had a copy to bring it today, and then Kevin and I had to go to a meeting with the mayor and she kept my book, all right? Uh, but on the front of the book, it says final draft. It's just a draft, this is all a proposal. When the board approves it, hopefully in October, it becomes final and then we submit it to the Western Area Power Administration and fulfill our duties. And then every year we have to report on our progress to the plan that I talked about with you. Okay, my apologies, we ran a little bit over. If you gotta take off, that is no problem, that's no big deal. If you wanna stick around and ask questions, we're gonna do that. I'll stick around and answer them as long as you want. If you don't wanna ask questions in front of the group, then just wait it out when people like Don are done and I will talk to you afterwards, okay? Before I forget, in case anybody has to leave, Thank you very much. You've been great, not only tonight, but through this entire IRP process. And real quick, right back there in the back behind me, guys, raise your hand, all four of you. That's our crack resource. Boy, they're really excited to raise their hand. That. <laughs> That's our crack resource and transmission planning staff there, okay? Uh, a couple of them are more into transmission planning than the resource side, a couple more on the resource side. The gentleman back there in the blue polo, that's Gian Chan. When I show you all the analysis and everything, Gian does most of that. A lot of the other guys have to double check his work, but Gian's kind of the engine that makes all this stuff run. Uh, Gian's the one that when the Inflation Reduction Act got signed by President Biden, I was in the next morning and said, Gian, we need to run something. <laughs> and Gian said, you know the meeting's in three days. And I said, yes, I know, okay. So thank you very much, guys. All right, let's go ahead and start with questions. Don. I don't understand the macroeconomic model. When you begin to discontinue coal, all of our three owner partners probably don't suffer economically if we discontinue our relationship by the appointed year. But there are hundreds of groups like this meeting all over SPP doing something similar. So you're going to end up with companies that rely on long term contracts and have long term debt retirement built into their models that can't sustain losing two thirds of their revenue like Mid-America Energy, NPPD, and uh, <clears throat> what's the North Dakota group that owns the Laramie River Station? It's a cooperative, but Basin, Basin, Electric. Basin operates it. Basin Electric. Huh? I, I can't pull my mind toward the model that continues to function in that environment so then will the market be flooded by discount energy coal based? OK, so number one, I'm glad that that turned out to be a question about retiring coal resources, because your first words were, I don't understand the macroeconomic model. And I was going to say, neither do I. OK, <laughs> um, but when you look but at you're the, paid to understand it, <laughs> I'm an look, amateur. Remember, look at the coal resources. Right. So what we're assuming here is Look, we're a small partner in Gerald Drummond. We're a small owner in the other two, Laramie and Walter Scott, right? If we said, hey, we're going to get out of a plant, well, you're going to have to buy your way out, but that doesn't change anything. The plant's still there. What we're modeling here is that there are forces in the world from natural gas and CO2 pricing that are telling you, 
that plant is no longer financially viable. It is not helping you financially, it's hurting you. And under those scenarios, it would be. And so the theory is that we're not the only ones that see that. Your other partners and part owners do. And collectively you say, hey, this plant has reached the end of its course and it's gonna go away. And I will tell you with two of them, Larry River Station and Gerald Gentleman, they're long enough in the tooth. You'd say, hey, that plant's had a good run. I wish it would have ran longer. It was a good resource, but you know what? It's okay. Walter Scott 4 would be a little different because that one's got a lot of debt on the books. That's a pretty young plant. But that's what we're assuming, Don, is these need to go away because they're financially burdensome. We can do something else that will be better. You're making a financial decision. That's why the timing is going to be important. We're trying to have these go away by recognizing when is the right time because of pressures in the world to remove them as opposed to just doing it arbitrarily. But they still have their legacy debt retirement as part of their model. If they're new enough that they still have a lot of debt. In the case of things like Laramie and Gentlemen, there's not a whole lot of debt. There's some, but not like you built the whole plant. But that is a consideration. If you go and take a plant that's got a lot of life left in it and you retire it because it's not working well financially, well, you don't have the operating costs, but all the money you spent that you borrowed to build it, you still have to pay for that. That's one of the things we always have to juggle. Kurt. I wanted to sh share some speculation. When you look at what's happening in Europe, that is an inter interesting model right now for what happens when you put in a crazy price of natural gas, that they are going back onto coal, uh, avoid, uh, stopping the retirement of nuclear plants. But I'm going to guess that the longer term uh, effect of that is going to be pushing energy storage tremendously hard. Uh, I think liquefied natural gas has its problems. So that's why we study that wide range of natural gas prices, right? Because historically, it's very volatile. And what Kurt said is correct. When the price changes, you know what? Everybody else in the world changes what they're doing to either change it or capitalize on it. And you're right, that drives a lot of things. There's a lot of decisions you would make if you knew the gas price was always gonna be high. A lot of decisions you would make if you knew it was always gonna be low. If you have a high gas price, it definitely spurs technology because you can afford to pay more as an alternative. Okay, anybody else? Can, uh, just can tell ask. your reaction. Uh, the book Electrify, he says, the solution to climate change is to electrify everything. That's good. But then he also goes on to say that would require three times as much electricity to be produced as now. Is, is there any room in your thinking or your modeling if, if that sort of thing happens? So I only covered it briefly, but remember one of the sensitivities we ran was electrification sensitivity where there was a lot of load growth and not, I think in the summer we were looking at like a 50 some percent load growth and in the winter, I didn't do the math, it was way higher than that because the winter load was higher than the summer load. And that's exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of a weird conundrum because we're the electric company. So when you talk about we're going to run a sensitivity where everything's on electricity, that kind of sounds good, right? But then you look at this, and you're like, but gosh, we got to come up with all the resources to meet that load and within the construct of our decarbonization goal. We talk about these kind of things all the time. If you have a lot of electrification and your load goes up and you have to meet it, that's a high class problem because who wouldn't, if, you know what, do you think Coke would complain if the president came out and said, every American's gonna drink three cans of Coke a day? No, they'd say, that's great. But as soon as they said that's great, they'd say the same thing as us. Well, geez, how are we gonna make all that Coke? That's our problem, right? We like the electrification, it's in our industry, but we got to figure out a way to serve it. And with the decarb coal, that gets even more difficult. But if that's the way things go, that's our job to serve. Yes, ma'am. This may be really simplistic, but is the WAPA going to be okay with a report that says our final plan is 20% undecided? That's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know. I've never given them a plan like that. Uh, but I will tell you the one, so they have a lot of requirements for things we have to include. There's one thing we covered tonight that I don't have to include, the decarbonization plan. They don't ask you to do that. 
They say, we want your plan for the next five years. That was the five-year action plan. That was concrete. The decarb plan is what we did on our own to try to make sure that we had a plan for going towards that. And I, again, you may not agree. I 100% believe what I told you. The worst thing I could have done tonight is give you a concrete plan that says how we're going to get all the way to 100% because the last 20 would have been baloney. And what good is that? That's just taking us down rabbit holes that we probably don't want to go down. Now, if you come back in about 10 years to an IRP meeting, and I'm still telling you, ah, the last 20, 30 percent, we'll figure it out. That's probably a problem, all right? Because at some point, we got to get dialed in. But for right now, we've got almost two decades of runway. We need to use it. Ken. Well, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you. Uh, I've attended a few presentations about IRPs over the years, and this was actually the most understandable one I've ever attended. I mean, yeah, okay, I cannot. No one's ever told me that before. So thank you. <laughs> so so congratulations. And, and I, I guess I, I wanted to indicate that I also appreciate the fact that you've that you've unveiled this over a period of time, that it isn't just something you did on one night, that it's happened over several months and that we have some time to comment yet. So so thank you to you and, and to the LES board and staff for making that happen. Um, I did have a question. Uh, when you talked about the solar resource, you, it, it was resource singular. Would I presume that would not necessarily foreclose building uh, facilities in several locations? Correct. That's uh, all got to get figured out, right? Um, okay. With the SPP rules the way they are, there might be a little more risk in doing multiple, but doesn't mean that you're not going to pursue all those things, okay? It's quite possible it ends up, look, you could go build one resource that's 150 megawatts, or you could build five that are 30, you could build three that are 50, all kind of hashes out the same. You got to make sure that dollars and reliability wise, what's the best approach? But yep, that's all fine. That's all on the table. And I guess the other thing that I wanted to suggest is that I think there's also, and I I do not know the details of the IRA, but, but the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's my understanding there's some provisions in there also about energy efficiency and particularly supporting low income projects and I think there may be some opportunities to further expand the SEP by using the resources there so so yeah, I encourage I, you to examine those I well. don't believe you're in the minority I think no one knows for sure what the details are of that act other than the people who are drafting it right uh, so that's one of the things that we have to do and not just for the energy efficiency for the whole thing see when it actually comes out and you can actually look at it in black and white all the rules figure out what's in there and see what we can use to our customers advantage Question down there. Yeah, oh, we have a question from the. OK, from the chat. All right. Um, if the plan includes 200 milliwatts of wind and solar, what happens when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining? OK, so good question. Remember, we're part of the Southwest Power Pool, right? In real short form, if you came to the SPP workshop, you heard all this ad nauseum. Real short form, it used to be not too many years ago that we were what's called a balancing area. We had to match our generation and our load every second, every minute, every hour, every day, forever. In 2014, that changed. In all of the Southwest Power Pool, which if you haven't seen the map, it runs from northern Texas to the Canadian border about the width of Nebraska all the way up. It's a big region. There's only one balancing area in SPP, and it's SPP. They dispatch all the generation to serve all their load in their footprint. So there are days where we have a lot of generation online, very little load. There's days we got a lot of load and even more generation, okay? They don't match up anymore. What that means is if we have wind and we have solar and they're not putting out energy, that's okay because the SPP has got all the resources in their footprint to fall back on. And they're doing things like that reserve margin requirement. Remember, have enough generation to meet your peak load, accredited generation, the generation we can count on at the time of your peak, plus an extra now 15% to account for things like when the wind isn't blowing, and the sun isn't shining. If that's not, if 15% isn't sufficient going forward, believe me, they'll change the number again. And as the resource mix happen, changes, that may happen. Anybody else? Yes, Lori. So uh, first, Scott, I'll echo uh, Ken's congratulations on a, on a really well done process. This has been super interesting this year. So thank, thank you. you. Um, so it seems like a lot of this, this is a message I get. A lot of this is, is tied to this EIA book. And so I'm wondering a little bit about that. Is it like, how nimble is it? 
if something is proven to be a, a, a reliable source of energy so that you can put it into your portfolio, can you do they update that or is it something it takes forever to get that done and kind of related to that. So it's been interesting. Um, I have I've read a little bit about this in the last few days where California was having electric vehicle owners um, put electricity back into the grid as a test. And so I'm sitting here thinking, oh, are they trying to get some some minimal base level so that they can put that into their portfolio and say, we can use this at 8 p.m. And so anyway, I'm just wondering a little bit more about how that works. Okay, so first question, the EIA thing, right? The EIA updates this book every single year. I believe it's every three years they completely redo the thing, all right? So they redo the thing every three years, every year they update it. Uh, and they have proven technologies in there and then stuff that you really can't even buy yet, but they still model it to give you numbers for it. Uh, they're very nimble. And they're very good. It, it blows my mind. I'm not kidding you. Every time that, I don't know if anybody else asks them questions, we ask them questions. I know the first time we were reading the book and like, hmm, this doesn't make sense. And we said, how are we going to figure that out? And I think I told some of the guys who were here, I'm going to email the EIA. And they're like, you idiot, the EIA is not going to answer your email. You know what? If you send the EIA an email every time, within an hour, they send you an answer back. I get much better response from them than I do from LAS staff. They're really good. So they do a great job and they're very, very nimble. If you're interested, the link is in. So we have a big set of references in the report. That book is linked. It's pretty easy to look at. It's a long read, but you can look at it real quick. It's really cool, actually, what they put together. Okay, your other question on the EVs, right? That's what they're doing in California. They're doing those tests right now to say, hey, someday, just like we show SEP up there, X number of megawatts, could we have EVs up there? X number of megawatts. Uh, I will tell you, honestly, that's going to be easier said than done. It's one thing to technically see, can we do it, right? Then you have to talk about, well, what do I got to compensate people to let me mess with their battery, right? And I'll give you the litmus test I tell folks all the time. They're not exactly the same, but it's a pretty good analogy. You know what? I'm going to give you like 10 bucks a month, and anytime I want, I can come take gas out of your car for my car. Well, that sounds pretty good until the day I come take gas out of your car and you get up the next morning, you say, dude, what are you doing? I was going to drive to Omaha today. That's where the difficulty comes in, right? So there's got to be just the technical part of spitting the energy back out, but then all the checks and balances that you can override it if you're the customer to make sure, no, no, today I got to go a big trip to grandma's tomorrow. Please do not deplete my battery. And then you also have to worry about the wear and tear because every time you cycle these batteries, you put a little more wear and tear on them. So all that's got to be figured in the incentives. It's a cool thing technically. It's going to take a little bit to figure out the pricing part, but we're glad they're doing the technical part because that's the big hill. We get over that, we can figure out the pricing stuff. Anybody else? Ken. Uh, yeah, we're being told by OPEV people that we trust that uh, because of Southwest Power Pool's lag, time lag, they can't close one of the North Omaha uh, power stations. Do you see SPP uh, problems as we go forward with these kind of plans? Or So real quick, uh, Ken was talking about that OPPDs made some changes uh, to their plans for a coal plant, keeping it going a little bit longer because of that backlog at SPP where you got to wait three or four years to get cost pride numbers back before you can add generation. And do we foresee those things going forward? basically, right? Yeah, for uh, so like I said, right now is a good time to be a little long on generation. Otherwise we'd be facing the same problem. What we're hoping, SPP has a plan and they're working it right now, that the reason we say they're three or four years behind is because they're gonna be dug out of the hole in three or four years. And it appears that they're making progress. Our hope, and it's just a hope, is that by the time we get to the point where we need to do something, they're actually through that and you're getting a fairly good turnaround time, something more like a year that you could use for planning. You know what though? If you get to three or four years from now and they still have that problem, you're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna deal with it. But we're hoping that we can wait it out a little bit. And we think that's true because anything we do, even with the local solar project, look, it's gonna take you a little bit of time to figure out what you actually might do, where it would go, all those things, that's not easy. Then you get in the SPP process. Hopefully by the time you come out the other side, they have figured out their problem and there's no longer a backlog. That's our plan. We'll see how it works out. Okay. 
Thank you very much.